This program is a presentation of University of California Television. Your support makes UCTV's programming possible. Contribute online at uctv.tv slash support. Check out our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, at youtube.com slash UCTV Prime. Subscribe today to get new programs every week. friend, Saskia Sasson, who most of you know uh, for her work on global cities. Uh, Saskia is the Robin, Robert S. Lynn Professor of Sociology and co-chair of the Committee on Global Thought at Columbia University. Uh, and her most recent books are Territory, Authority, Rights, From Medieval to Global Assemblages, uh, and a Sociology of Globalization. And she's recently done a fourth fully updated edition of Cities in a World Economy. Uh, among her older books are The Global City from Princeton University Press. Her books have been translated into many languages, and she's a recipient of diverse awards, uh, including being named as one of the 100 top global thinkers of 2011 by Foreign Policy Magazine. And I'm sure after you hear her comments tonight, you'll see why uh, she received this designation. Tonight, Saskia is going to talk with us about a very interesting topic, the topic of expulsions, inequality's next frontier. Please join me in welcoming Saskia Sassen with a warm welcome <laughs> to the University of California. What I want to do tonight is more an exploration than a description. Uh, there is no conclusion to my talk. What I'm trying to do, and I do that, I've been doing that since I started doing whatever it is that I do. Uh, I like to capture the emergent shape of unstable situations. I think our current period that begins really in the 80s with a big bang, uh, it, begins to emerge already in the 1970s, in fact. But the Big Bang, disability, et cetera, uh, is, is really in the 1980s, is a period where stabilized meanings have become unstable. But in that instability, of course, are shapes. It's not that it is shapeless. It's not that there aren't. But it's difficult to capture those shapes with the established categories uh, that we have used for a prior period. Now, I want to develop one particular aspect, because it is a huge subject. It's a collective subject. Me alone, I can cover only a little bit of it. But tonight, I want to focus on one particular subject. And it is the notion, uh, a question, if you want. At what point, when you have more inequality, more poverty, more displaced people, more environmentally produced uh, uh, forced migrations, more, 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 at what point are you on the other side of the curve? And you need new concepts, new narratives. You've got to capture it. You've got to take that first step, rather than simply saying more of you know, whatever it is. And so I, I, tonight, I want to focus on questions that can be described as having to do with more inequality, but that actually are beyond inequality. And so I use the term expulsions. Now, I use it. I grew up in, uh, in Latin America, in France, in Italy, et cetera. And the word expulsions is actually a very light-hearted word that captures sort of when you expel a student for, uh, you know, whatever, having put chewing gum on the blackboard, you know, something like that. I want to destabilize the meaning of expulsion. I want to recover the violence in that term, rather than something that is sort of, uh, you know, whatever, part of daily life, part of the quotidian. I want to argue that a lot of the trends that we're seeing are a kind of expulsion. Now, 
in my research practice, uh, and we, you know, we who do research, we have to sort of take cognizance of what are the concepts and the positions that guide us, that lead us, what are the questions that obsess us. But I realized that after 30 years, you know, I didn't realize it when I started, but after 30 years of this kind of work, that I look at extremes. Extremes are heuristic. They tell a story that is larger than the thing itself. Extremes, however, do not represent the majority, the main, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So what I describe tonight also is a set of extreme conditions. They are not necessarily the norm. They are not necessarily what holds for most of what is happening. But they do illuminate something that is happening. And the question is, how significant is that? And so in, in, in my research, I have taken two positions. When I studied the global city, I positioned myself at the center of power. That's an extreme condition. Most of what happens in society, sort of a bubble somewhere in the middle. It's certainly not the center of power. In this study, I position myself at the edge of the system. <coughs> that is a systemic edge. It is not a geographic edge. So the edge can be right there in the middle of Manhattan. You know, it, it doesn't, it's not the border with Mexico, let me put it that way. And that positionality matters a lot where you position yourself. And I call this analytic tactics. Uh, my concern is really, I'm putting in some slides because I know this is a fairly international meeting, so I'm hoping that, uh, you know, since I am not a native English speaker, this is a footnote now, hey, in case you're losing the, the, <laughs> the narrative here, but uh, mixing the two, the complexities of what I'm talking about with my foreign sort of accent in English, I thought a bit of text, a bit of the visual, nice letters would, would help. But at, at the heart of the effort then is this notion that power is made, powerlessness is made, inequality is made. These are not somehow attributes or functions of something that is there, sort of this capturing of the making. And secondly, the notion that method is not enough. Method matters, but method is a discipline. Method will guide you. A well-established method will guide you to look at certain issues and not at others. And I know that here you have a huge, I think the largest, somebody told me, global studies program in the American university system. When you deal with the global, method, established methods can be a problem, and some of you must have encountered that issue. Uh, not always, by the way, but for certain kinds of questions. So I use this notion of analytic tactics, and I mean it literally. Tactics, tactical analytic moves. What I was saying before about positioning myself at the center of power, or positioning my, my, my inquiry at the edge of the system, in other words, where the expulsions happen, or the incorporations. Those are analytic tactics. Now, a second uh, analytic tactic that I like to use is to actively destabilize existing meanings. Now, as I said before, no meaning is forever stable. But there are periods when a certain stability you know, uh, happens. So I think, for instance, this is another little project that I'm thinking about and working on, the social. I think the social right now is very unstable. I would say that the social was quite stable uh, in the post-war, you know, Keynesian period in Western countries, and that includes South America, North America, Europe, and, you know, and some other uh, parts of the world that were sort of, you know, a shadow effect, if you want. Today, the social is unstable. I have a little thingy that I'm writing that I call the unstable social. But part of the analytic tactic is to actively destabilize. So for me, for instance, confront it. And I recommend that every now and then when you're doing your research, when you're figuring out what is your object of study. Confront it with a very powerful explanation. My first move is not to reject it, but to ask, what is it hiding from me? An explanation must eliminate all kinds of things. Otherwise, it's a description. It's not an explanation. 
So a powerful explanation should not be rejected. There are reasons why it is powerful. It is capturing something, and that something you know, resonates with whatever people think. But you've got to handle them as very dangerous presences, I think, at a time you know, of unstable meanings. So I want to know what, what is in the penumbra of the light that that powerful explanation produces. You know, it's sort of the proverbial notion of bright light, dark street, circle of light. The more you can see <coughs> in that circle of light, everything, every little scrap of paper, the more difficult it is going to be to see through the shadows in, uh, around that light. So that is a bit the notion. Now, some of my students say, oh yeah, I'm going to reject that explanation. No, that's not, that's far too easy. You cannot simply reject a powerful explanation, but you can interrogate it. Say, okay, what are you hiding from me? So a lot of the stuff that I'm talking about uh, today has to do with capturing what is in the penumbra of what sort of hits us frontally, you know, what we can immediately see and immediately understand. Um, um, now, I also sort of, as a, as a framing, that, that third element here, I'm very intrigued by recovering a very old category that is, uh, that is sort of taking a very long siesta. It hasn't worked analytically for a very long time, and that is the category of territory. I am, I am sort of obsessing with that category, precisely because of digital era, space-time compression, you know, all the familiar issues. It sort of is part of this analytical tactics. And, and so part of the, the notion is that, um, that, that we have flattened the notion of territory into one meaning, the, the Western-style national sovereign state. What happens if we try to free the notion of territory, which is very rich, full of meaning? Territory is not land, it's not ground, it's not space, it's not earth. Territory is a construction. It has embedded logics of power, embedded logics of claim making. It's a collective production. No matter war, wh where and at what period, all complex forms of organization have had territory. Nomadic tribes make territory. Territory is made. I don't know if any of you saw a little story I was asked to write for Art Forum, you know, this art magazine, uh, on, on the Occupy movement. And I wrote about territory. And in a way, the, the image that I produced for the Occupy movement, I loved having the chance to write sort of a fairly you know, abstract piece, if you want, in Art Forum. But um, I said, you know, uh, occupying is different from demonstrating. Occupying is making territory. It takes time, day after day, it's hard work, social capabilities are developed, you've got to keep the peace, etc. What was the ultimate provocation in Occupy Wall Street? was that they occupied, i.e. they made a new territory in the territory of global finance, which is, of course, Wall Street. Now, there is a bit of a figurative element here as well. But the point that I'm trying to make is that part of the conceptual framing, part of the, theo the theorization, if you want, that I'm after, has to do with liberating categories such as territory, such as authority, such as right. Tonight, I'm looking more at territory than any of the others. But we have flattened them into, I repeat, one meaning, which is the meaning of a national state. Now, if I look, when I look at global finance, um, which operates to a very large extent in electronic space, global finance does make a territory. And it's not just that literally territorial moment in global cities when it hits the ground. It also happens in electronic space. So, so I want to use territory in a, in a very sort of analytically productive way rather than, than in a flat way. Now I'm going to, to begin to, I want to illustrate with, with some issues. And here the issue is, that the matter is the making part. So when you think about immigration today, when we say immigration, we're using a very powerful term that we immediately 
you know, immediately can relate to it, full of meaning, full of history, full of geographies, of sufferings, of emotions, of you name it, thick and plentiful. So how do you begin to suspend that meaning, you know, in terms of this notion of powerful explanation, you know, ask what does it hide? So here is just one little elementary uh, routine, uh, which is the notion of not the immigrant person, but the spaces, Let's see. the immigration spaces. And they are made, and they are different. So here you have a list you are reading while I'm talking, I'm assuming. And you can see all these different spaces. A given immigrant can shift between those spaces. And those spaces are made. And they're made by powerful actors, and they're made by not so powerful actors. But the whole point here is that making. Second one, destabilizing meanings, remittances. When we say, I should actually wait here a bit. When we say um, remittances, that is again one of these categories full of meaning, charged with meaning. And so how do you destabilize it? And the other thing that happens partly because of this kind of you know, meaning rich term is that when you are in the United States and people talk about remittances, the assumption is always, aha, the remittance is sent by immigrants who come from poor countries and send money back to their home countries. So remittance, and when you are in Germany, it is the German, right? The immigrants that are in Germany and send money back. Remittance has acquired a very particular meaning, which is money sent by low-income immigrants who are in rich countries and who sent money back. So I ask myself, well, if I look at what are the countries that are the main receivers of remittances, and I take a global perspective rather than a country-specific perspective, I get a very interesting story, which is in that the top 10 recipients of remittances are five rich countries. And if I take the top 20, the United States is also a recipient of remittances. Now, I just use this as examples of illustrations. They also get at, at, at a story, clearly, to illustrate what I mean by destabilizing these categories. And if we're trying to understand a period with such instability in, in the meanings that we deploy, because the underlying conditions are changing, you know, then we need to do this kind of work. Now, you understand what lies behind these figures. If this were a classroom, I would, of course, ask you, what do you think it is? It is the fact that high-level professionals are also sending remittances. Remittances are measured through central banks. The money that is why, so they underrepresent, of course, uh, the money that is being remitted. But a global perspective, as opposed to a country-specific perspective, will tend to show you that a lot of rich countries are among the key recipients. Now, I think that, continuing with this illustration you know, of the subject of immigration, I think that um, the making of where we are at today with immigration in this country, we can say similar things for other countries, but I'm just focusing right now on this country. We are here, you know, certainly California is a critical zone for immigration. So what, what I want to emphasize is that the situation we're in now, this extreme anti-immigrant virulence almost, that was made. The fact, the control mechanisms, they were made. It is not simply a political decision. It is not simply an ideological fervor. It was made. And here are some of the data. I don't want to read this, but you can read it. Here are some of the elements. And you can see enormous, I'm assuming that everybody can see this so that I don't have to mention it, yes? Yeah. So you can see enormously sharp increases in just about everything. So that's one kind of making. Then, extremely important, a bit gone under the radar screen, what the politics and the legal aspects vis-a-vis -vis immigrants have become. And here what we have is truly an abuse of the jurisprudence on immigration. First, when immigration was shifted to homeland security. Homeland security is about terrorism, something like that. It is not about immigration, and immigration is not about it. So that's already very problematic. And then the passing 
one of the points there in the middle. The passing of all these particular little bills at local levels. The famous mayor of Arizona, or whatever, the sheriff in Arizona, right? The fact that they could pass little bills which allowed them to violate the national law. So go do raids to factories and to homes. That's not legal. But under Patriot Act, that was possible. The fact that we detain people, we, you know, they, they are picked up on the street, they don't have their passports or whatever identity, I don't have my passport always with me either. They're in jail, some of them we know we have 320,000 immigrants in jail just over these last years under some of these provisions that these local bills allow. So to do rates that are illegal in terms of basic standard law, only under Patriot Act, emergency law. We know that many of those 320,000 who are in jail are citizens. They are Latinos in their cultural, whatever, but they're citizens. And we know that many of them are legal immigrants. They have never been given a hearing to show that they are just not giving them a hearing is a way of preventing them from demonstrating. Now, what kinds of here we are beginning to move into this notion that we're way beyond inequality? These are literally expulsions, expulsions from a legal framing, expulsions from <coughs> long-standing rights like habeas corpus. We have pre, uh, uh, pre-trial solitary confinement, habeas corpus, out of the window. That's affecting a lot of people. We have unlawful detention, those 320,000. And we have a regime that I'm sure that some of you know, that and we, the, the notion, we don't know how many, but the notion is it's over 100,000 in this country. You are told by the government, Department of Justice, you're under surveillance. You cannot tell your lawyer. You cannot tell your family. You cannot tell anybody. This is a contract between you and me, the state. What is that? Now, this is happening in, Fran in France. This is happening in Germany. This is happening in the UK. This is not only the United States. And that leads me to think that at some point, we have a whole sort of transversal space that is beginning to concentrate enormous capabilities in the name of security. And where more and more citizens, we're all suspect. Are we the new colonials? You know, what, what kind of uh, image is this? Now, in the meantime, you have read all of these numbers. The result of all of this is really quite dramatic. It is extraordinarily dramatic. The state actually, when it wants to, can make a huge difference. One wishes, of course, that it also practice that vis-a-vis -vis other things. So as you can see, um, uh, the, the, one of the most dramatic issues is, of course, the, the really radical fall in the migration of undocumented people. Now, whether you think that is good or bad is another matter, but it's a very radical fall. Very interesting point, the likelihood, last points at the end, the likelihood of undocumented migrants actually returning once they have been deported is at the lowest level ever. The likelihood of return migration, very, very low. So all, that is what I mean by making. All of these policies have worked. One does then ask oneself, why can't the state deliver policies that also work vis-a-vis, -vis, if you want, the social question? You know? reducing inequality, reducing harm, reducing all the various things. Um, now, under this notion of unstable meanings, I want to argue, this is sort of one of the, I don't just want to argue it, I'm also trying to research it, the notion that beneath the virulence of hatred, opposition, difference, you know, we're different, blah, you know, all of that, actually, structurally speaking, immigrants and citizens are approximating each other. And so I want to sort of play a bit with that argument, again, not, not fully documented at this point, but um, one is the security apparatus that I just mentioned, where in terms of the logic organizing that security apparatus, we are all suspect. If 
terrorism is the most, the biggest, you know, the, the existential threat. If terrorists can be anywhere, we're all suspect. And this is beginning to happen. There are all kinds of people who are people I know, who are in solitary confinement, and they have not received a trial. So this is quite extraordinary. Now these are very, as I said, I'm looking at extreme cases. The majorities are not affected right now. But at what point, you know, does it alter the systemics? And when you look at sort of the, the, the spread of surveillance, the militarizing of our cities, you know, you have a sense that there's also a systemic bleeding into other situations. Um, so here I have a whole series of slides that I'm not going to, to talk about too much, but just quickly read them, and I'll just mention the key points. An enormously sharp increase in all kinds of elements. And so I have several slides on this. By the way, I will leave these slides here so you can go back and study all the numbers in, in, uh, in, uh, in care. So the, the um, questions of the budget, uh, final point here, at least 20% of the government organizations working in counterterrorism were established or refashioned after 9-11. These are sharp and brutal histories. Brutal in terms of both what I described about immigration, what I described here, what I will describe about finance. It is extraordinary to me the kind of accelerated histories that we're seeing in a whole series of domains. I repeat, immigration, this. Now here, more information, just you know, read the first sentences. Uh, an enormous incidence of private firms, very, very high level of private firms, a vast amount of building of facilities. Um, here, for instance, you know, the, the, the the fact that of the many, many companies that are, that are private that are working here, uh, many have top-level security. Now, this is a very important issue, you know, because the question, now, I frankly, I have a lot of problems with the category security, national security. So in, in one of my projects, I argue that when you have asymmetric war, the pursuit of national security, national security in quotation marks, you know, it, a very classical notion that goes along with the modern state, if you want. The pursuit of national security nowadays becomes the active making of urban insecurity. So, so a lot of this material, the, the, such a heavy presence of private actors in what we call national security, is already to me an indication that national security is may have been a a fairly stable meaning during World War II, you know, et cetera, most maybe of the 20th century, I would say. But today, it is a deeply unstable meaning. And so my issue is that more, the more you pursue national security, the more you're going to have urban insecurity. Now, that's a bit of a quick, you know, but it, it helps me sort of move along. Now, here, um, there you have the figures, you know, of the more than 854,000 people with top secret clearance. The estimate is that 265,000 uh, are private contractors. Private contractors were always there. The incidence of private contractors, that is what has changed. Now here is a map. I, I don't think you can see it. This maps all the sites in our country where you have private uh, security work going on. Thousands. Now, what I'm interested in grabbing here and understanding is to what extent, we, as I said before, we are seeing the formation of a new type of cross-border space that has very tight borderings, but they're transversal. So it connects a bunch of countries, not all the countries in the world, not at all. Huh? It's a very particular specialized geography. But those borders that border that space, no coyote, no trafficker can take you across those borders. Those are borders that are far harder than the Mexico-US border. So it, when I just allow myself to think theoretically, and again, I repeat, I'm dealing with extremes. 
as I said at the beginning, right? This is most of what is our society, most doesn't quite fit there. But I want to understand something about emergent shapes, unstable landscapes, and what are the shapes within which they sort of take place, emerge. And so one question I have is if I can manage to bring data for France, for the UK, and for Germany, what do I get? What do I see? Now, we already know, if you look at you know, the standard subjects, I'm sure many of you have studied, WTO, you know, all of these sort of new types of international organizations, or the current manifestation, the manifestation that starts in the 1980s of the IMF, World Bank. We have similarly you know, these, these, these uh, bordered spaces that have very tight borders. The fact that people who work in those institutions have all kinds of protections. You know, now the IMF at one point deployed 40,000 economies across the world, destroying those economies. Of course, they needed protections, but you know, there there is a. And and I I just mentioned as a, as a, I have I've done research, I've written about this, but I mentioned as a little example. So I I met a friend. This was maybe 10 years ago or something, or somebody I thought was a friend in a bar somewhere in Asia. I can't remember where it was, frankly, because the, the content of the story, and, and he tells me, I've just been offered to be minister of state in my country. Minister of state is the highest level of minister, you understand? It's not just minister of I don't know what. No, minister of state is the, the core group up there. And he said, he had worked for the IMF for a very long time at a very high level, and he said, I have a choice. I can stay within the IMF regime, basically be a citizen of the IMF. And then I will have all kinds of protections. And my fellow citizens will not even know. Or I can exit and then be just like one of them, you know, subject to all kinds of. Now, I was a, a, a bit shocked at that. But it also was, for me, an illuminating bit that I then research a bit more with these protections. And we really have a proliferation of regimes that, that have created these, these uh, some of you may have read my work on these, these transversal bordered spaces. And they really are bordered in a way that is much sharper than the traditional interstate border systems, which never worked perfectly, of course. And, um, and, and you know, there is this notion, a very common notion, that, that uh, we're sort of, there is less bordering in the world, let me put it that way, in our global world. There is less bordering of the old sort, the interstate borders. I think there is. There is far more freedom of circulation for finance, not for immigrants, but, you know, for a lot of other entities. But, is there, are we really a less bordered world? That I'm not so sure about. Because I think we have a multiplication of these transversal borderings. I have a very, very long article on this in the, in the I think, Michigan law, International Law Journal, a very serious, good journal. Anyhow, um, another one, very boring article of mine. But, and here is more of that. You know, This is sort of um, more of these entities. Now. Um, this is more of that. Let me focus now on this issue of inequality, which dominates um, so much you know, of the debate and the, and the discussion. And, and again, my emphasis here is that inequality is made. I frankly don't think we will ever get rid of inequality. That, because of so many reasons, you know, because, because if, it, if it is only because of the structural differentiation of complex systems, whether they're economic systems, political systems, you know, infrastructural systems, there's so much differentiation, I don't see how we can ever have equality. Nor do I think that that's necessarily an aspiration to fight for because it's sort of, it's dead on arrival because our systems are so differentiated, however, there is a limit, <laughs> I think, to the kinds of inequality that we can absorb. And so I just wanted to, I love this chart for the very simple reason. You, all, all you need to see is the shape. Now they give me a very good, let's see, is this it? Yeah. So the, the years here, are, this is 1917, these high points here, 1927, 1932, you remember that, right? So what it describes is the share of national income, and we're talking earnings. In other words, people who are at the top have other sources of, of income, clearly. We're talking earnings. The top 10% the top of earnings. So that was up to 47% of national income. 
uh, in that first, uh, those first three decades. And then, of course, we had a nasty crisis. This radical drop, I mean, isn't it the drama of the ship is extraordinary, I think. So anyhow, that is 1942, the adorable Keynesian years, huh? And then we have, can you see the little green point? Yeah? Very good. And then 1987, now mind you, in 1987 I was arguing, but I didn't have the data, the, you know, I didn't have this data then, that, that we were really, I could just see it was not evident still, but that we were putting together economic subsectors at least that we're going to make for growing inequality. Anyhow, then it goes up, and this is 202, 203, and the next chart I'll show you, it goes a bit further. But what I, I want to point out, this notion that I said before, you know, that systems are made and they vary. So in these years, mind you, the, the, top, the top earners, 10% earners, still had a very robust share huh, of national income. It was like 33%. But there was something in the systemics of that period, mind you, also in the geopolitics. These are complicated situations. That made it possible, if you want, because this fall is the gain of the middle class that grew. Now, mass production, mass manufacturing, there was a clear, sharp algorithm that produced, that more distributed, not, not equality, huh? but more distributed. And there is something in the algorithm in this and in this area era that does not do that. Now, here is, a, here is another very nice chart. Um, this is the percentage growth of the top, well, well of different, this is the growth from 1979 to 2007, and the data actually go on because now we have the 209 census and they sort of just show the same patterns. Now, this top is a growth of 281%. It represents the top 1%. Now, this one down here grew by 95%, and that is the top 20%. Right? So they did very fine. What I want to point out is that 50% of the population had barely any growth. Secondly, very important, that when you read the literature in this period, the notion is one of growth and everything was great. There was, in fact, a visual order. We might also call it gentrification, upgrading of cities, a building, you know, whatever, I mean, all those terms, that produced a very strong image. Things are good, things are dynamic, things are great. I mean, there was an extraordinary growth. It was an extraordinary renovation of central city spaces. I remember, I, I mean, I, I, I grew up in Buenos Aires. And when I went back to Buenos Aires in the 1990s, the city was a transformed city. At the same time, but invisible, the traditional middle classes were getting really, really poor, to the point that they had food riot. These are the traditional, we're talking professors, teachers, dentists, accountants, the types who would not join riots. I mean, they broke into, into shops for food. This also is happening, by the way, now in Santiago de Chile. Yeah? This is not that the traditional middle classes. So the, the point here is that there is something about the systemics that makes invisible certain uh, declines, or in this case, this, these impoverishments. And I think of that also as a kind of expulsion. It's expulsion from a frame through which we understand. It's expulsion, I would say, with the, with the immigration issue that I talked about the, about the beginning. The fact that immigration has been put in homeland security is a kind of expulsion. It's expulsion from a possibility of being seen as you're a citizen. Of course, from another country, but you are a citizen. And in many cases, of course, they are citizens also from this country. So th these are very, at the beginning, the fact that immigration is in homeland security, it may still be maintain the difference between the immigrant as a potential citizen, a future citizen, and whatever, the terrorist. But eventually, you know, how do we keep that differentiation? Now, I couldn't resist, of course, and check out, this is, <coughs> this is not pure entertainment, you know, but still. Who are the top 1%? Well, it turns out that the famous top 1% is actually the top 0.5%. Again, look just quickly at these figures because I, I don't have time to dwell on them. But uh, there they are. Clearly, the, just look at the bottom 20% have a maximum of 16,000. That's pretty low income. The bottom 40%, a maximum of 33,000. That's low. 
the bottom 60%, a maximum of 60,000. I feel super rich, by God, with my academic salary. 60% in this country, that's the maximum that they earn. Those are low figures. Now, they may have other sources of income, you know, of course, but. Now, I have to touch on finance. And I want to do that very quickly. I can't remember how much time. I have a big clock, but then I always forget to see when I started. This is a problem that I have. Um, but this, if there is something that marks those two top, you know, the, that, the beautiful graph that I showed you earlier, the two tops in the 30s and then here, it is the financializing, the rise of finance. And um, finance. Finance is very different from traditional banking. I like to make this difference than simply say that, that, um, that you know, a traditional bank sells money it has. A financial firm sells money it does not have. And therein, in that not having, and yet <laughs> growing lives the creativity of finance. The creativity of finance, by the way, is partly fed, as you probably all know, by the mathematics of physicists, not of economists. And the mathematics of physicists have as one key feature that they factor in the incompleteness of the model. In other words, opening. An algorithm is an open, is an open architecture. So, so I think that here's a whole combination of interesting elements. But I want to, to use this, this uh, case here, credit default swap. Some of you have heard of this, of course, most of you probably, to illustrate two things. One thing is the capacity that finance has to make. So this is, uh, this is again a very short history, 201 to 207, 208, 207. The high point is 207. At this point, these, these, uh, these fake insurance instruments, because they were not really insurance. Insurance means that you can back it up. When the claimant comes and says, OK, I want to cash in, uh, the money is there. The money was not there here, and this caused a financial crisis, not the mortgage people. Huh? That is why I, that's the second point. But anyhow, here, on, back up to the first point. So here, this is under one trillion. In seven years, it reaches 62 trillion. Now, it's a very sharp curve. I cannot think of many things that can grow by so many multiples in such a short period of time. Maybe some of your credit cards, you know, but that's quite an achievement then, too. Now, 62 trillion, just, that is, by the way, not real money, you understand? That sort of, poof, it could go away. Like, in fact, there was some banking figure that was circulating at the time, you know, in 2008 when the crisis breaks, that was like $170 trillion in sort of traditional bank assets. And, and not, not so traditional, actually. Uh, and, and 50 trillion disappeared. And so my students then asked, so where did they go? Who got them? Well, nobody got them, of course. You know, it was like a deflation. But anyhow, 62 trillion is the value of global GDP. The, the, it's more than the, the, the value of global GDP. All countries, included, including China, is 54 trillion. Now, by the way, footnote, footnote, the total value of financial assets, assets here is debt, huh? uh, financial asset is debt. <laughs> um, but a debt with a promise of super profits, a kind of a special kind of debt. Uh, the, the total value was $630 trillion when the crisis breaks in September 2008. That is almost 15 times global GDP. Now, a second footnote, it is easy for finance to have a greater value eh, than, than, um, than, than GDP. Eh, that, that is, finance is precisely about that gap, that not having. And so the, the value right now, the, the value of financial assets to, global, to, to GDP for the US is 450%. That's a bit much. Germany, who's doing better, eh, it's under 200. So there's a difference. But you know what I mean is here that, so what one has to understand that finance is really about that gap, that financializing logic, rather than money per se. Now, the second point I already made it is that this was the source of the crisis. This maligning of modest people that they, they got a house that you know they shouldn't have tried to get is, is, is truly bad. So what happens here is that, that uh, and it really takes off you know, in the early 2004, et cetera, 
is that there were half of the, half, but some of in the world of finance thought, ah, this role is going to go on for quite a bit more, and others thought, mm, this is not good. Soros thought this is going nowhere, and he made a pile of money, but <laughs> anyhow. So some then, those who thought, mm, this is going to go very well, invented a new instrument that they called an insurance instrument. It was a derivative, it was not an insurance. And they felt, yeah, this, they're not going to cash in that insurance because they're going to keep on making money on their instruments, you know, the instruments on which they were getting this supposed insurance. Then when the, this is a, to me a very interesting twist, sociological twist, when the foreclosures begin to happen, especially they become very visible by 206, 205, 207, very, very visible, of modest houses owned by modest people mostly, that creates a crisis of confidence. So those people who were already in doubt uh, say, all right, I'm going to cash in. And that is a, some, a process that goes through for three years. And those who sold the instruments did not have the money, and that is, then you have the crisis that sort of explodes. It was brewing, huh? it was brewing for quite a few years, but it explodes in September 2008. Now, there is an image that I like to use, again, one of these de destabilizing a meaning, the notion that powerlessness under certain conditions can become complex, and in that complexity make a history. This is the case, that those, those people whose homes were foreclosed, millions, huh? they, they are powerless. They were powerless then, but they made history because the titans of finance suddenly were little cowards, very, very worried, and, uh, and they actually contributed to the crisis, but not in the way that is usually described. It was as a crisis of confidence. This is the money crisis. And what, what the, the foreclosure, the value of those, for, of, the, of those homes that were under these very particular kinds of mortgages was under $800 billion. That could not have brought down the system. $62 trillion, on the other hand, was you know, a kind of a crisis. Now, I, this just very quickly, just as background footnote, the incidence, this is 208, when it, this is the moment, this is the landscape when the crisis explodes. And you can see, Two things took a lot of people by surprise. One is how high Europe is, because it was really a crisis made in the United States. The problem is that a lot of what stands for Europe is American financial <laughs> firms' activity. So Europe is almost like the United States. That took, because the Europeans by themselves would not have had, but since you had so many Americans. And the other one, look at Asia. Asia then had an economic, a bit of an economic crisis, but you know, totally different. Now again, this to me is all fascinating. I could go on for a long time on this, but I won't. Now, what I wanted to quickly get to are these issues of foreclosures. Now, some of you must know this. I have two graphs that I want to show you. And so, oh, the title disappeared here. This is um, New York City, short and brutal history, 202 to 206. The numbers that you see are people who have all lost their homes, more or less, we don't know if all, huh? But, they certainly almost all have been foreclosed. And they, it represents the share of bad, toxic mortgages that they were sold within a given population. So in 2002, 4% of whites got these toxic, which by definition we're going to take them under, 13% of blacks. This is the high point. Look at this, blacks, 47%. Latinos, 39. We have this data for all the major areas, including for California, which is quite something. Um, quick footnote. For these toxic mortgages to work in the high finance circuit, um, they had to sell 500 of those to just generate one, one option that a high level investor. So they literally rammed them down the throats of these people. All that mattered was the contract. Not the house, not the value of the house, not whether the people could pay the mortgage, all of that didn't matter. Maybe at the beginning it mattered a bit, but eventually nothing. 500, and we got more than 15 million. So that's how many were you know, around. Now here is, here is another, I have too many options here. Here is very quickly the foreclosures. Now, very quickly, in 206, this is a very short history when this really catapults. 1.2 million foreclosures. 
which is up 42% from 205. This is one in every 92. 207, another 2.2 million foreclosures. 208, another 3.1 million. 209, another 3.9 million. This is all addition, okay? From 207 to 209, there was a 120% increase in foreclosures. That's significant. 2010, another 2.9 million foreclosures. Between 206 and 2010, a total of 14.2 million foreclosures. Now, a foreclosure does not necessarily mean that you're out of your house. And a house can get more than one foreclosure. What we do know is that over 7 million people are now out of their homes, that there are tent cities and slap cities. Slap cities are the desert, you know, so the wind. So they are in a rickety bus or whatever old bus and a slap to keep it from flying off, I guess. But uh, they, also, they are also invisible. We have lost track of them. We don't know them. We, we don't know where they are. Some of them simply went to poorer housing. Some of them doubled up, etc. We know also that there are uh, up to 9.2 million that, so in other words, another 2 million besides the 7.2 million that are probably going to be thrown out. The total potential is 14 million plus something else. Now, I'm Dutch. My country has a total population of 14 million. So for me, 14 million. Those are 14 million households. That could be 30 million people. 40 million people, you know, a household can be one, can be two, can be five. These are expulsions. We are way beyond inequality. This is my image, this is from Chinese art of dead cities. Here's a better one. He, did, he got so sick of all the high-rise buildings in Shanghai. What I did not talk about, I have a whole other half. <laughs> uh, yes, I know, we profs, but uh, where I talk about global south issues, uh, you know, the displaced, forced migrations, uh, the 70 million hectares of land that have been bought just between 2006 and 2010. The buying of by foreign investors and, and leased by foreign governments. The, this buying of land has been going on forever. I mean, you know, King Leopold said, let me go buy some land, and he bought the Congo, right? So, so but when you see a shape in the curve, this is social scientist in me, huh? The 206, 20, shoop like that. All these histories, they all have the same time frame. Violent, brutal, and short. Who are the main buyers now? Not China. Financial firms. So we have literally, I'm, I'm looking at 93 contracts. Mind you, there are 1,000 contracts that we're talking about here. So, so in the global south, what, what does it mean? Now, let me give you a concrete example by using China rather than the financial firms. It's much more intermediated. It's an investment. Land stands for water, food, and rare earth. You can't go wrong. So Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan have both bought vast amounts of land in Ukraine. You know, Good high quality earth, you know, the tundra there. Um, but but um, let's when China buys 2.8 million uh, uh, hectares in Zambia to do a plantation of palm for biofuels, a plantation is a very significant step. So a plantation means evicting faunas, floras, rural manufacturing district, smallholder agriculture, whole villages. It has transformed. Zambian territory into a mere commodity that we call land. So there's a whole other, you know, the conceptual apparatus comes back to the question of territory. Uh, and, and, you know, and um, so when, when, uh, when Anglo, when, when uh, Ashanti Gold, the big mining company from South Africa, buys, uh, not buys, leases, because this is what they do now. They tell the, the, the local indigenous people and the national government in Colombia, oh, you can stay here. We are not, you know, 15 years and we're out. Well, what they want in those 15 years, I have to show you this because it's an amazing thing. I see all these other slides. I knew that I was not going to show them, but this is really worth seeing. So all they want is what they need is, is that the water? Yeah, open mining, you know, fracking. Uh, which they will take, they, they need 250,000 liters of water for our one hour of work for 15 years. That's all they want. They don't want to own the land. They are not going to displace the people. And then they, the area has 100, last line, has 161 water springs. Water springs is where water originates. That's where it comes from the depth of the Mother Earth so that we can access it. Well, by the time they're done, you have dead land. And so I am making a map, it's very difficult, of dead land in our world.
I have three research assistants and they're going crazy. It's a very, very elusive subject, mind you. But um, I think that part of our global history is dead land. You know, I mean, um, there are many ways in which you kill land, and some of it is permanent and some of it is not, clearly, right? I mean, for instance, if there are these micro histories that people don't even know that the Americans raised a lot of cattle in Kenya and literally killed the land. In, in same thing in Salvador. You know, this is just cattle. I'm not even talking plantation stuff. So anyhow, so, so I don't know if I'm explaining, but to me, this is a bunch of things mm -hmm. that calling it, putting it under expulsion is a way of exiting the sort of neither here nor there, a bit more of this, a bit worse of that, a bit more poisoning. No. I think that at some point, again, the shape of the curve invites a move, a conceptual move that you say something else is happening here. And so that is what I'm after. Now, the theorization is very much connected with my territory authority and rights book, you know? And so the, the territorial aspect in a lot of this stuff, you understand the foreclosures and this land stuff, you know? I mean, there are, there are some interesting symmetries here. And um, the security apparatus, and we, the, colo the new colonials, we, the citizens, you know, who are suspect and, you know, have the whole security apparatus looking after us. Thank you. <laughs> so, but, you know, I'm at the beginning, and, and it, uh, this, is a, this is a big project.